Yeah. Hi everyone, um, I'm Derek Jones, as Austin said. Um, I work for Tasnet Works, so people here who aren't familiar with Tasnet Works, we own all of the poles and wires in Tasmania, so the big transmission ones as well as the little distribution ones and the ones that go in your house. Um, my job in Tasnet Works is an innovation engineer, so I'm in the innovation team, and in really simple terms, what our job is is to take ideas and turn them into solutions as well as understanding the problems that are going to face our network in the future and coming up with how we're going to deal with them. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about why we're looking at energy storage as networks, um, then I'm going to talk a, bit, a little bit about what we're doing and then how we're doing it and where we are at the moment. So um, perhaps to demonstrate why, and this might be a funny place to ask this, but how many people in this room have solar generation on their roof? <laughs> Pretty much everyone. <laughs> Fun that being at the solar. <laughs> um, this might be a bit more um, different answers. How many people here have a battery in their house they use for storing energy? Um, anyone here yet? One. For the house. Or for the house. <laughs> yeah, we've all got batteries in our phones. <laughs> it's really hard to say that in a way. <laughs> so. Are, they, are you connected to the grid or are you off grid? UPS. UPS, right. Two. Yep. So, I mean, I guess um, we're all seeing that customers are interested. They're investing in solar generation, they're investing in batteries and things like that because they want to take control of their energy consumption. They want to save on their energy bills, they want to do their bit for the environment, um, and they want to manage their own energy usage. So, storage is coming, we know that. Um, some is recently made a prediction that we're going to get 20,000 batteries connected in Australia this year. Um, I had a look at our records today and we've apparently got seven connected in Tasmania this year so far. Um, I suspect that there are some that are connected that we don't know about though because our uh, processes are new. Um, so why are customers installing storage? Well, they're doing a couple of things. One of them is for backup for UPS reasons. So in a lot of parts of the network our reliability isn't stellar. Um, what's, happened, what's happening around the country. So people are installing batteries for backup. They're also doing it for price arbitrage. So basically they're taking their um, energy at a cheap price and moving it to a more expensive price. So for instance, you're storing your excess solar, so instead of getting six cent feed-in tariff, you're using it later when it's worth 27 cents for you. Or if you're on an energy tariff where electricity is more expensive at certain times of day, like the new time of use tariff we've recently made available, you might be charging off peak at 14 cents kilowatt hour and consuming at peak times at 32 cents a kilowatt hour. So you're saving money on your bill that way. And I guess it's also the taking control of your energy thing. It's, it's managing your own energy connection. And for some people it's going off grid. We know that. So for us, for a network company, storage could be a good or a bad thing, or a mix of both, which is usually the case. So it could be bad, for instance, customers could go off grid. We've all heard of the death spiral where people go off grid and then we've got the same network supplying less customers, which means more people go off grid because we've got our own prices and so on and so forth, and then we've got the only grid with no one connected to it. We'd rather that didn't happen. Um, similarly, um, similarly, you have the case where um, we might inadvertently end up with a case where, where, where some customers without batteries are effectively paying for customers who can afford a battery. So people who can't afford a battery might get here and end up paying through their network charges to people who need a battery. But there are a lot of good things. So if used correctly, batteries can reduce the amount of network investment we need to do in the network. Um, they can avoid blackouts, which is a reliability improvement for customers, which works well for us. And I guess importantly for this project, we can use it as a source of network support. We can ask these batteries to help the network when we need it. So I guess the start of this project was a bit of a vision for the future, which looked a bit like this. So in the future, customers have batteries, and they bought these batteries because it makes sense. Um, they're cheap enough that customers want them, um, and they're bought buying them to manage their own energy use. And when we have a network problem, the solution's already there. So we have a problem in the part of the network, and there's enough batteries that all we need to do is start paying the customers in that network, part of the network, a bit of money, and our problem goes away. So this benefits the people with batteries, obviously, because they get paid for solving the network problems. It kind of benefits the customers without batteries, because if we didn't have those batteries, we'd have to build more network. 
and then we'd have to recover all of that money from the customers. So the bill doesn't go up like it would have if we had a normal network. And for us it benefits too, because we don't have to build the network. And the problem with building network is that sometimes load goes down and it turns out you don't need it. So we're not building network that isn't used. So to make this vision a reality, we sort of we need a few things. We need there to be enough batteries out there to do something useful for the network. We need there to be enough batteries so that we've got a network problem. There's enough in the area to do something useful. With. We need to know where they are so that we can you know, which one's buy for help. But importantly, and this is the real reason we're doing this trial, is we need a way of asking these batteries to help us. So we need a way that we can ask these batteries, can you discharge for us now to resolve this network problem and we'll pay you. We don't have that at the moment. So in the words of Wernher von Braun, who was a German slash American rocket scientist, he says, one, expert, one, uh, one test beats a thousand expert opinions. So we decided we needed to run a trial. So what are we doing? Um, it's always worthwhile to define the outcomes of a trial before you start, we found. <laughs> Just a bit rude. <laughs> <laughs> what we really need is we need a solution. As I said earlier, the innovation team is about generating a solution. At the end of this trial, I want to be able to go to our network planning department and say, hey, here's, just, here's batteries, customer batteries. You can use them to solve network problems. Yeah, this is how you can do it. This is what you need in order to make it happen. So what do they need to know? They need to know how much it costs. If we need 100 kilowatts of network support in this area, how much money is it going to cost us to make that happen? We need to know the risk, and this is an important thing, and it's often forgotten when you're talking about using things like customer batteries to resolve network problems. If we ask for 100 kilowatts of support tomorrow, how much do we actually get? Do we get 50 because some of the batteries don't respond, or do we get 150? This feeds into our economic analysis so that we know whether we need more. It feeds into our operational planning so that we know if we need a backup plan. And we also need to know what other things, what, how do customers feel about us using their batteries. For instance, if we use the batteries every day for a week, do they start complaining? Do they say, no, you're not going to use that anymore? So that's the main outcome for the trial. There's probably another, I guess, broader outcome is it's about the capability of Tasmania as a whole. Like we want it so that when customers are thinking of getting a battery that's been connected in Tasmania, they're thinking, maybe I should get these controls so the Tas networks might be able to pay me some money in the future if they have a network problem. I'd like the installers to be talking to their customers about this when they're considering a battery. Because for this vision to happen, customers need to install these controls when they, when they install their battery. So we sort of needed a trial to try and get a look into the future where this vision's a reality to see whether it's actually practical, to see whether it works. And we needed two things for that. We needed a location, where are we going to test it, and a platform, what sort of platform are we going to use to test it on. So um, unsurprisingly, looking at the name of the project, we're testing it on Bruny Island. Um, Bruny Island is a little island um, down south. Um, I, how many people here have been to Bruny Island before? <laughs> it's a nice place, it's a tourist location. Um, we have a problem on the island where every time there's a public holiday, everyone goes to their shacks on the island, <laughs> and the load goes up. Um, Bruny Island supplied by two cables. The first one was installed in 1949, oh, and the second one was installed in 1959. Um, they're still in pretty good condition, but they were installed at a time when a customer with high load had two lights in the fridge. Um, in fact, the wire that's in the cable is probably thinner than the wire that goes through a house from the street. So at, at peak load times, that cable gets overloaded. So what we do is we turn a diesel on, basically. We put a diesel that's just south of the neck that we start whenever the load gets high. The controller and guys get a little alert and they start it up. Um, the old uh, sort of planning adage is diesels are really nice as long as you never run them. <laughs> They're really expensive to run. So we had thought of um, removing some of them, or reducing that diesel use a bit by getting a battery. Um, a few years ago we were looking at a battery in a shipping container next to the diesel. The problem is that Bruny Island is a public holiday peak, which means that 350 out of 365 days a year the battery is not doing anything useful. 
because there's no load issue. So we thought, what happens if we put these batteries inside the customer house? What happens if we give the batteries to a customer? Then they get the benefit of 350 days a year because they're managing, they're storing their excess solar. And um, then we ask for use during peak times. And I guess importantly for us, for any island, the risk is managed pretty well. I can tell the control room guys the diesel's still there. If the batteries don't work, just to start it off like we always have. And that makes them happy. So we presented this um, problem we had at Bruny Island to a company called Deposit Power. Um, unfortunately, the bottom of the screen is cut off there, so you can't see the other down there. <laughs> so at the time when we talked to them, um, they had about five employees and about as many batteries installed. Um, now they're a little bit bigger. Um, and they were looking for a network customer, so they proposed to us a project, an arena funded project. So how many people here know who Arena is? A few. So Arena is the Australian Renewable Energy Agency. Um, their job is basically to make it so that renewable energy becomes a thing in Australia. So they take things that are not quite you know, commercial yet and make them commercial by giving them grant money. So we proposed a project that looked a bit like this to them, the Bruny Island Battery Trial. So what we would do is we would install some batteries in some houses on Bruny Island and we'd do research on them. So primarily this is a research project. We got funding under the um, research and development realm. Um, there are five people working together on this project. It's a bit like herding cats. Um, three universities, us, and a positive. Um, the three universities are all researching something a little bit different. Um, we've got Australia National University. So Reposit make a little optimizer box that sits in your house and tries to make you as much money as possible from your battery, basically. What Australia National University doing is they're making a, um, these batteries aware of what the network's doing and the network aware of what the battery's doing. So they can sort of come to this optimal solution as to how they can resolve, we can resolve an error problem and the customer can make as much money as possible. Uh, University of Sydney are coming up with new ways of paying customers for network support. So we have an amount of money that we can spend and it's about what's the best way of distributing that money amongst everyone who's supporting us. And University of Tasmania are doing social science research. So they're um, the ones who are going to tell us how customers feel about upgrading their battery for them during network peaks. There are two industry partners, as I said, us and Repulsive Power. Um, there's about 30 to 40 customers on Bruny Island participating in this trial. It looks like we're getting at about 35 or so. And about 150 kilowatts of battery power output that we're going to install. And probably about twice that in energy. The total project is about $8 million. Um, of that, about half a million is installing batteries, so most of it's research. Two years of research around, after all. So, how are we doing this? Um, so, the purpose of this trial was about replicating this vision that we had where customers have batteries and all of that sort of stuff. So, the main properties of this vision are customer choice. Customers chose to install the batteries, they chose who their installer was, they chose what they installed, and they're using, they're paying for their batteries, and they're using their home internet connection and that. So we tried to replicate that as much as possible. So customers choose to participate, obviously. Um, they choose what they install, they choose how it's installed, um, and they choose their installer. We pay them for network support, but the customers also pay something toward their system, so we're not giving them away for free. Because many studies have shown if you give people free things, they don't care about them. Oh, that's that thing that tells me it's installed some smoke can out of it the other day, you can't come and fix it when they want it. Um, so basically, it's implemented as two parts. There's a subsidy to get customers to install things, and then there's the ongoing payments that we pay once we've they've installed their system. Um, the subsidy looks a little bit like this. Um, incidentally, all of this stuff is on our website. This, the uh, consortium, and I'll, give you, I'll show you the link at the end. All of our tech specs are on there. Would the um, customers um, already have um, PV or I'll wind? Talk, I'll talk about that a bit later. All right, thank you. Probably best to keep questions to the end, so we don't yep. derail it. Good. Um, 
So basically, the aim of this subsidy was to make a solar and battery system affordable for customers on Rooney Island. So $3,200 per kilowatt of power output from the battery is what we're paying. Usually that is more than the battery costs. There's a minimum contribution of $2,000, and that exists so that customers who already have solar and don't need a solar array have a payback period that's about the same as customers who are installing a solar array to participate. And there's a maximum subsidy because if you don't, someone will install all of the batteries, and it's not distributed anymore. Um, we must have solar, so a customer who's participating has to have a solar array. Um, two reasons for that. One of them is because it's funded by the Australian Renewable Energy Agency, so we probably better have some renewable energy. And the other one was that a solar array is how the, a, a good part of how the customers make money from their battery, storing their excess solar. Um, we didn't tell the customers what battery they had to install, what size solar array they needed, all of that sort of stuff. They chose that for themselves. Incidentally, they're all using the same battery, but that's because their battery gives them a big subsidy. Um, they choose their installer out of a list. We gave them of six installers. Um, we selected that through a tender process that we had. Um, seven in applied, we appointed six because one of them didn't want to use a of power. Um, we selected a list basically to ensure we didn't get fly by nighters come down, do a dodgy job, and then disappear when the warranty claim rolled in. Um, Initially, or we're, we're paying customers for their support during the trial, and initially we're paying the customers a dollar a kilowatt hour for the energy that comes out of their battery when we ask for it. So basically it has to be enough so that, because the repository power box is an optimizer, it tries to make them as much money as possible. So we need to offer enough money so that the way you can, that box can make as much money for you as possible is meeting our network support request. So even if that involves charging up during peak times, you're making more money than you spent to fill the battery up. Um, University of Sydney um, will come up with new power pricing methods that we'll test during the trial at different times, but they haven't worked out what they look like yet either. They say it's something like a shaky value, I've got no idea what that is. Um, we expect we're going to pay customers about one to two hundred dollars per year in network support payments each. Um, we are using the customer's internet connection, so um, some customers are installing an internet connection specifically to participate. And the reason for that is twofold. One of them is that if we add the cost of an internet connection on top of the cost of the battery, on top of the cost of the positive aggregator fees, it's not economic anymore. And the second reason is um, that in the future, this future world where customers are installing these things, that's what they have to use. Um, the internet connection has to be there because if we don't have it, we can't ask the batteries to help us because that's how we do that. The repository controller also uses the internet for weather forecasts. So it's quite smart, it learns about your energy usage, um, it knows based on this sort of weather forecast what's going to happen in the future with your, with your solar array based on historic experience. And for instance, it'll charge up off peak if tomorrow's going to be cloudy, and things like that. We have, we've got one, um, a battery with a repository on a, one of our facilities at work, and you can see that happen, it charges off peak. Um, the largest single part of this trial probably has been the customer engagement day. So as usually is the case, um, it's the, the technology is actually quite easy. It's easy to go and install the battery and then have a positive ask it to do things for us. Um, the hard bit is getting the customers on board, getting on, make sure, making sure all the customers understand what they're doing, and just generally how the customers feel about things, because everyone brings something different to the table. The process that we followed with customers was fairly simple and it was a bit like that. So first we informed customers of what we were doing and tested how we intended on doing things. Uh, then we called for applications, uh, selected some customers and currently they're all installing their batteries. So we informed customers, so Bruny Island is a small community, generally the grapevine works really well on Bruny Island. If you let one person know, everyone on the island knows within a couple of hours. Um, that works really well for information you want known, but also information you don't want known. So it's about making sure the right information's out there so that there aren't misconceptions floating around. Study for the ferryman. Um, we also tested how we were doing things using a few focus groups. So we got a few people on the island together, asked them um, whether they how they felt about paying to for their battery, whether they were happy out for us to use the internet connection that they provided and things like that. And generally they were pretty supportive. Um, 
We opened for applications through a couple of forums. Um, there was two of them, one in Hobart, one on Bruni Island. I absolutely love that backdrop on the Bruni Island one, which is the top picture there. Um, it was really great. Um, the one in Hobart we had about 40 people at, and the one on Bruni Island there was standing room only. It was very popular. Um, we had applications open for two months and we got 119 applications and considering there's about 300 permanent residents on the island, that's a pretty good number. Um, and then we had to select people. So um, there were two, well I guess there were things that a customer had to have to participate and then there were the things that we preferred. So our most preferred customer looks like this. Generally customers had to uh, be in the right part of the island, so there's a little part of Northern Bruny that's supplied by a different cable. And useful to us. And they had to have an internet connection or be willing to get one. Um, then we had the preferences and basically that was about maximising the amount of research we could do on the customers. So to do social science research someone needs to be there. So we picked residential people who were usually there as our first preference based on what they told us when we asked for applications. Um, of the 119 applications, more than 100 of them were people who were there on the island at least part of every week. Um, to actually select the customers after that, we did it randomly. We drew them out of a hat. <laughs> a blue sparkly hat. Um, we had a um, probity consultant come in and help us for this trial and we asked him to draw the names out of the hat and he said it was the strangest thing a customer had ever asked him to do. Um, but it works. They it's really understood that when you draw names over hat they're random. We sent out 35 offers in round one. Um, about 26 of those looks like they're going to install batteries. Um, we sent out three offers in round two and I've got applications from one or two of them at the moment. Um, once we sent out offers to customers, they needed to go and install the battery. Um, for this was a bit of a hair-raising process for us because it's all in the customer's hands. So you sort of don't see what's happening until you actually, customers get to the point when they need to ask something of us. So the customers sort of go through three steps in this process. The first step is about deciding what sort of system they want. So they go and engage in an installer, they get quotes from as many installers as they like out of the six that we selected. And we did see that a lot of customers talked to multiple installers some of them got quotes from a few installers and played them off against each other for the best price, which is good, that's what we want. Um, and some of them just picked an installer they liked based on people they knew or something like that. Once they had done that, they sent something to they sent it to us, they sent the quote to us. Um, if we thought it was all okay, we'd then send them a contract. Uh, once they a customer had the contract, they went and installed their battery. And once it was installed, we inspect it and then pay them their subsidy. Uh, we've had one battery installed so far, and there's about another five or ten being installed at the moment on the Rooney Island, so the installers are going pretty hard at the moment. Um, the issue we've sort of had is that when a battery manufacturer says it's available in a month, they actually need six months. Um, Customers generally um, are installing this new LG battery that's just come out, the LG Resu 10, the 10 kilowatt hour battery, and the reason they're doing that is because it gives them a big subsidy. It's got a 5 kilowatt hour output, so that gives them a $16,000 subsidy. Um, whenever you make a subsidy of a design available, you sort of encourage customers to do something, and that something is install a big battery, but that's useful to us, so it's not all bad. Um, that battery is sometimes oversized, so you get customers with an average consumption of 3 kilowatt hours a day installing a 10 kilowatt hour battery, but I guess I'll have plenty of battery power if the lights go out. Um, a probably good thing is the customers are usually, uh, the, the solar arrays that customers are installing, they sort of tune what they install based on what they can afford and what their energy usage is, but usually they're going for a smaller number of cheaper panels, rather, uh, more expensive panels, rather than carpeting their roof in cheap panels, which will fail in two years, which is nice to see quality. Um, internet connection, um, there's sort of a mix. A lot of people are using this NBN satellite, which is really good. Um, it's really good that that was launched because it made things far easier. Um, but there are a few people with dedicated mobile phone data connections. Um, Easter 2017, so this Easter coming up will be the first time we're going to use these batteries. There probably won't be enough installed to actually reduce the diesel use much, but at least we'll prove that it works. Um, so 
the inst- we, it's it's been very interesting this process. It's been a learning experience for us. Um, it's good to see this customer dynamic about how they select an installer or what they expect their installer to do. Um, last week we had this drop-in session on Bruny Island where customers came and talked to us about what was going on, and it was interesting. So I was I had two customers come in for the same installer, and the first one says, "Oh, the installer's terrible. They never told me what's going on." Then the next in, next customer comes in and says, oh, the installer's really great, same installer. Oh, I call them up and they call me back and tell me what's happening all the time. So the expectations customer has are very different. Um, backup power. So probably it's a bit better now than it was, but up until recently, most battery systems you got the grid connect didn't actually do backup. So when the power went off, you'd have a full battery with the lights and still off in the house. So most customers in on Bruny Island are installing a system that will back up their house because obviously they're on tank water, so they have water pumps. Um, if the power goes off, the toilet, they can't flush the toilet. Um, so it, it's, and I guess, um, an interesting thing of dealing with the, the Bruny Island community is sort of um, everyone knows everyone, so a customer will ring you up and say, oh, talk to you about an issue, and they'll say, oh, other customers done this, and I'll say, oh, that's them, I just know it, they know everyone. <laughs> so I guess in conclusion, um, this trial, we're sort of trying to test the vision, we're trying to bring this future world to now so that we can see what's happening, what's going to happen in the future. Um, we're currently installing batteries and we want to use it for the first time in Easter this year, and there's a whole bunch of research going on, and I'm quite happy to come back later on and tell you how the research went. Um, because the researchers haven't done most of it themselves yet. Um, is there any questions? All of the information is on Bruny Battery Trial The contract that you're issuing for a dollar a kilowatt, is that, that a limited time? Or? So there's actually two contracts. The yeah. first one, there's the participation contract governs the subsidy, and that basically is the three year research project. And then there's a separate grid credits agreement, which is between the customer and reposit which is, covers the dollar a kilowatt hour use of the battery thing, then that one lasts forever, but the customer can choose whether they want to. They can leave that at any time. Is this the same as the solar system where you install solar panels at 28 cents a kilowatt, and then five years they drop to six? The thing is, um, because the repository power controller optimizes, makes as much money for you, if we offered the customer, if we offered you six cents a kilowatt hour to discharge your battery, you'd say, nah, I'm not taking that, and you wouldn't do it. So the controller will try and make you as much money as possible, and if you don't offer you enough money to respond, you won't respond. And that makes sense. Like, if it's not in your economic interest to respond, you shouldn't, and there are some situations where we're better off with using batteries because it's just not worth enough. Just to clarify, that dollar a kilowatt hour is only at times when you would otherwise be using the diesel generator. Yes. So only during the public holidays or yes. the peak times of the public Only holidays. during peak times. It's only as we ask for the support. Every, uh, all of the rest of the time that they're a standard solar customer. Obviously they won't feed very much into the grid because they have a battery. We can store most of their solar. Any other questions? Why are you interested then in this project when the customer's got control over you and the amount of money and when they feed it to you and you, they, you're tapped into them and you've signed an agreement? Surely you must have some control and yet it's their money but they've put some into it. That sounds like a trap. I don't know where it is. It doesn't feel right. So it is the customer's battery. They own it. Um, basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to make it so in this future world where customers have bought batteries. So um, in this world where we haven't paid a subsidy for the battery, the only time the customers are going to respond is if we can offer them enough money to respond. Well, that's no security for you. That's a risk thing, and that comes back to this whole risk thing. We need to try it to work out how real that risk is. Um, in the end, generally network problems are high cost and very short duration, so there's not too much issue in the network problem for us to offer enough money for it to be the most economic thing the battery can do to respond to us. The risks come around to, um, for instance, if the internet connection is down or customers haven't maintained their battery and it dies, um, and things like that. Or if customers go, oh, I don't like the deposit stuff and turn it off. But the thing is, without testing it, we don't know what sort of risk it is.
and that's why we're doing the trial. Which is why you've restricted it to 40 customers. Yes. It's also the fact that you get everyone on Bruno on the battery costs an awful lot of money. <laughs> Um, some of their last meetings said that the houses basically had to be completely rewired for this. Who, um, who pays for that? So the houses, uh, basically what we see is the same standard that you would have for normally installing a battery. There are customers on Brittany Island who have fairly poor wiring and they can choose to redo their wiring to participate if they want to. We um, basically pay in dollars per kilowatt. Um, there are some customers who have done rewiring work but there are others where the house is really fine. In the end, we actually don't know for the most part because it's between the installer and the customer. What's the average size of the units that they're putting in? Uh, the units, um, pretty much all of them are 10 kilowatt hour, 5 kilowatt LG Resi 10s. Wow. Um, they're really good, like they're the size of a desktop computer except they weigh 100 kilos. Are they a silicon type battery or are they uh, lithium? Lithium. lithium. And what's the size solar arrays are they putting in? Really varies. So we have one customer who's using their existing one kilowatt solar array. Um, I did tell them their battery's not going to actually be doing an awful lot, but they want them that anyway. It's their choice. Um, the biggest solar array is probably a bit over five kilowatts. But it sort of varies. It's actually quite a spread. So it's not everyone installing the biggest array possible. Um, is it a requirement? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Is it a requirement um, that the, um, um, well, I, that I guess the PB and I suppose the, the battery uh, shut off if there should be a blackout or a failure in the grid? No, no, they can sort of, they're, they're, they're most because of Because the, I yeah. think that's a requirement uh, here uh, um, be, be, because yeah. of the uh, possibility of, um, um, I suppose, electrocuting uh, repairs. So AS4777 applies, um, and what that means is basically that you can supply your house, but not the grid. So usually what they'll have is they'll have a backup circuit on their house, yeah. and it will supply maybe their lights and their water pump, and maybe the fridge. Yeah. Um, so usually they'll supply some of their house when the lights go off. So there's only one or two customers who may not have that backup. Is it possible to do that in the city? Yep. You can install one of these systems today. Okay. If you want to. Because that's always the concern, isn't it? I've got this big grey array on my roof, the power's gone off in the middle of the day and suddenly everything's, I'm yes. not getting anything out, but you can actually do something about it. You can, they're not very cheap. No, but can. it never would be. <laughs> what are the uh, sort of guaranteed life times and life cycle of these batteries? Uh, the LG ones in 10 years. Yeah. Or you have been cycles over 10 weeks. When uh, PV first came in, um, the idea was that you would use the grid as the storage. Um, now, is that idea just not possible now, perhaps because of the um, unexpected popularity? Um, so or, 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 yeah. or, or are networks missing out on a, an opportunity? Yes. Well, um, <laughs> we're sort of getting into the variegarities of network pricing here, and I'm ha probably going to be a bit complex to talk about right here. But you, you sort of, with the six cent fee interact, you sort of are treating the grid as a battery, just a really, really lossy one. Um, so, obviously, these ones are much more efficient. But the, but the problem is that the Bruni network is powered by a diesel generator. And you're trying only to get little, away from that diesel generator. Only a little bit of it, though. Yeah. It's only during public holidays, and most of the time the deal is not running. Yes? So there's really no plan to uh, put an extra 10 gauge wire across <laughs> the island? Um, if the current cables were to fail, we might be forced, but we sort of want to keep the existing cables going as long as possible because they do cost quite a bit to replace. So <laughs> they're between one and three million for new cable. Mind you, they do last a long time. The current ones have been in since 1949, but they're still fine. Wow. Is that passing? Um, yes, passing's accepted. <laughs> How do you ensure that uh, when you want to use, uh, want to take energy from a customer's battery, mm -hmm. that that battery is not 
will be flat. So, okay. wait, yeah. do you have control over the charging of the of the batteries? Um, do you just uh, look yeah. around for some that are full and take from them? We do it all through a price signal, so we tell the customers that tomorrow we're buying energy, say, between seven and ten at a dollar a kilowatt hour. The battery decides that's a lucrative thing to do, so it charges up to provide that support to us. So, um, yes, they will charge, but we're not directly controlling it. We're just giving them a price signal. But that's coming through the deposit. Yes. You're not actually relying on the householder saying, yes, you can take my battery. No. The repositories controls are designed to be set and forget, so customers can see what it's doing, but they can't control it. One point that was made by an email to us um, was someone was saying that they didn't want to go on board with this because there'd be the upfront charges to um, connect to the power, the, uh, the system, and the actual payback time to get that to get that money through the batteries to just put it worth its while. So are you talking about someone who's currently off grid? Um, they're going to go off grid. Yep. So if a customer's already off grid, then it's probably not economic to connect to the grid just to participate in the trial. Yep. Uh, and the, the fact is that once you get need a network extension to supply a customer, often it is actually cheaper to go off grid because it costs quite a lot to build a network extension to someone. And um, not only that, it costs quite a bit to maintain it. So is with that in, in is there an advantage in encouraging people, you know, if they're going to use batteries, which is what you want them to do, would you encourage them to go off-grid as well as using your system? So, um, obviously, for, cust well, for customers who are already connected to the network, we'd sort of like them to stay on-grid. Um, <laughs> that being said, there are parts of the network where there is a long part of the network supplying very few customers. So, um, we do have, for instance, one place up at Crotty Dam, which we did install the off-grid system for because it was around 20 kilometers of network to supply one customer. And that cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to maintain. That makes sense. Mm. Mm. Tricky stuff. Any other questions? Can, can we ask you questions on just general issues, not on console? Like, um, I can't guarantee I can answer them. <laughs> <laughs> um, is, is there any um, news of, of the government's approach to getting pumped hydro um, in, from any subsidies from the federal government for pumped hydro in Tasmania? I suspect if there was, they wouldn't tell me. Right. Um, so I haven't heard anything, but probably wouldn't even. Uh, Are there any other states around Australia, like you know, South Australia with Kangaroo Island doing similar things? Yes, so um, the South Australian utility has done, they, were, they looked at Kangaroo Island, with the, um, uh, they had to build a new cable out for that island recently. Um, they did a writ, and I think they sort of, the outcome of that writ was at the time, I think they might have decided just to build a new cable. With I'm not familiar with the economics. Um, so they have done um, a vaguely similar battery trial in South Australia, and of course AGL or Retail is doing a fairly big one in South Australia as well. And um, they have about a thousand customers there getting batteries. So other than us, Retail was the other logical um, participant who played with a platform like deposit. And in fact, on the mainland, um, there are two or three retailers that Reposit works with and you can sign up for a grid credits plan and then when the market price goes high, the retailer will pay you some money to discharge your battery. Did you ever have wind power as a possible option for, the, for this program? The, the problem is that we need it at a particular time and that particular time isn't necessarily sunny or windy. Um, so I guess the challenge with a variable thing is we can't guarantee that it's actually going to be there at the time we need it. So you sort of need some storage to do that anyway. Um, obviously we didn't tell the customers they couldn't install it if they wanted to, but no one has. For a house that's quite expensive. Just 
with, with the LG 10 battery system is that like it was a, a they bought them because of the subsidy. Yep. Um, have you got any comments about other battery systems? That, uh, so at the time when we started the trial, they, I mean, we said anything the reposit supports. Um, at the time when we started the trial, there was the previous version of the LG 10 wall, the Tesla Powerwall. Um, because the Powerwall has a lower power output and required a more expensive inverter, um, it ended up costing a lot more for a customer to get one of them than the LG 10. And then LG released their new version, which was bigger and didn't really cost anything more. So it became fairly obvious customers to pick their big LG. Oh, um, well the LG battery, um, what is that, a lithium battery? Yes. Or it, yep. Yeah, so I think I think we might get one red flow though. Would you be interested? I think it's the first non-lithium battery in the positive liquid. It's expected life cycle of these batteries? Uh, so I think LG warranted them for 10 years and it did save the number of cycles, but I can't remember off the top of my head. I think it's something like 4,000. Um, I think Reposit tell us that a normal customer with a Reposit system on average does about 1.1 cycles a day. The network support isn't very often, so it doesn't really affect that. And usually when we ask for support, we're asking for support at the time and the battery will be discharging anyway. We're just discharging it a little bit further. So you, you can read what the condition of the battery is, and then ask to take so much out of it with their permission or the computer's permission? So the, the Reposit uh, controller will do it if it's more economic, so if the customer can make more money by responding to a network support request, then they will by doing anything else. So they'll be making this sort of decision, so for instance, um, I could either use the energy I have during this the peak demand window on the, the time of use tariff, which is 32 cents a kilowatt hour, or I could discharge from Tesla Networks once and get a dollar a kilowatt hour. What I'm leading to is you're going to drain the battery dry. Um, there would be times when we'll drain it, but they'll probably drain it themselves anyway at times. If they're off grid, that'd be a bit of a pain in the ass. But they're definitely not. not. If they're off grid, they're not connected to the network anyway. Yeah. <coughs> so they, all of the customers who are participating are on the grid, so I mean they can't support the network if they're not connected to it. Uh -huh. A question about the cost of the grid power, would that vary um, or is it just going to be, or continue to be just a flat rate? Uh, so most customers are signing up for this new time of use energy tariff that we've, that we've made available to, that's available to everyone. Um, that has a variable price, off peak it's 14 cents a kilowatt hour, during peaks it's 32 cents a kilowatt hour, um, peaks are 7 to 10 a.m. and 4 to 9 p.m. And on weekends it's always off peak. So if there's not enough power and you drain all the batteries dry, the people are off grid, the ones no, that are on people. your system, people are off they're just as desperate it. as what you are. There's no people who are off grid on no. participating. Yeah. Then you drain their battery, and then they live off the electric, off um, your grid. Yeah, they'll be, they'll be... But if you're desperate, there. you'll get them off them anyway. So, um, we will drain their battery, well, we will ask for their support during peak times, yes. which will drain their batteries, but then there's no peak anymore because it's finished, and then they can charge with no problem. Oh, jeez, doesn't sound right. I suppose the thing is that you can actually take a lot out of the battery instead of just getting a triple charge. Is that how it works? Um, so, generally when we're asking for support, we would be asking for, like, if we were, if we only needed a, a little bit, what customers are doing in the normal time of use would be fine. Um, so usually we'll be asking the batteries to discharge fairly hard for a couple of hours. <coughs> we ask for network support, but we're paying them for it. So, and does 